Oh, here we are. After these wonderful words, it's quite hard to start, actually, after this introduction. So I would like uh, to speak through images. I think that's probably the best thing, uh, just to break the ice a little. So we wanted the images to speak uh, on our behalf to make you approach the world of the space. These images were a mixture of Arbatec, so our company premises in Turin, but also the international space space. We are talking about people like this, uh, who live within this, for example, Luca Parmitano is within this uh, space suit here, and you saw him also with some images of our premises, he's an Italian astronaut. These people, what do they do? They live and work basically on a place like this. This is the International Space Station and it's an orbitant base around the Earth, basically 28,000 kilometers an hour. So every hour and a half it goes completely around the globe. So they see 15 or 16 times sunrise and sunset in one day. As Arbutek, we said to ourselves, okay, we know this, we know astronauts, we also have experience because we have a team uh, detached with the training of the astronauts. What can we do with them? We thought, well, we could start something different. And different is going to be a word you're going to hear many times during this uh, meeting this evening. Mm -hmm. This is very important to do something different, it means not take ideas that are already uh, being done and really cook them up. We start from something that has never been done before, actually. Uh, diversity, difference is super important and also almost um, disorienting for competitors. So we decided to do something different and about eight years ago, I think, in 2008, after having had various experiences in Italy but mainly abroad, we worked with the US, with Russians, when we came back to Italy, I tried to start up a new company. I had and I have a certain experience around the world of the international space system and the astronauts. And so I thought, okay, I want to take some young people who can be able to take dedication, passion, but also new ideas. And thanks to this, we started to do a series of activities. All this introduction I'm giving you is to make you understand also and not focus just on the food for space, which certainly is important and we're going to talk about it. So we start with passion, dedication, young people, innovation, new things, new activities, things that are completely different from the past. And so we start creating Arbotech and we say, what are we good at? We know very well the life of astronauts, we know how they work, because we do training with them. So let's start from this unit, the training unit. And then, as we know very well, the life they carry out in the half-gravity that they're in, they're 400 kilometers from our life, and they have turned shifts of six months in this life. So, Manta Cristoforetti, Luca Parmitano, the two famous Italian ones, but many others also for there now, they're about six normally on the space base. 
lived there for six months. Imagine very small rooms, very um, constricting for six months. Life is really not easy in that circumstance. And so basically, what do they do all day? Every day, they carry out normal activities that you would do on the earth, but in a completely weird and uncomfortable environment. Will tell you with Stephen or which are the main difficulties for these people. Also, the difficulties of our body to adapt to this micro gravitational uh, situation, which they call in this way the phenomenon of everything flying around. If I have to brush my teeth simply, I can't spit everything into the basin. I have to throw it down my throat. This is one of the simple things. Any function, even eating, taking your food and taking it to your mouth, it hasn't been studied carefully, is impossible. Especially in the first days, even just um, swallowing is difficult. These people who work and live on this space station also carry out some experiments. When we started, we thought, let's start doing experiments ourselves as well, because our background is mainly in engineering. So we started to build actually some hardware and to send this onto the station to carry out experiments and understand phenomena that is not understandable from here and improve not just the life of the astronauts there but also everyday life on the Earth actually. Then we also specialized, uh, because we were born as an engineering company, we also specialized in doing something quite small, like small satellites, very small satellites. I'll tell you more about this. We're going to launch quite soon on an orbit of the moon, a 20 by 30 centimeters of satellite, like a shoebox within which there are some experiments and cameras that we're going to go and carry out in an even harder environment without astronauts in this case, of course. Then also the training unit I want to tell you about. We have these people who work in Cologne, an Italian team mixed with other people, nationalities like Russian, Dutch, and they train the astronauts. And from this team, one day in 2011, we received an input from one of these uh, colleagues of ours. He said, why do we think about uh, making astronauts live better when they're spending these six months on the station? And this is why Ready to Lunch was born. Uh, we approach the problem by saying for six months these people live up there, but they're people like us actually. They need to eat. Eat not just to nourish themselves, but also eat for a psychological reason. And within Argotech, we thought, but we have young people, we have ideas. And this is one of our main mottos. So let's try and give to the people who work with us, give them the tools to innovate. This is what we try to do through creating not just engineering laboratories, but also something for someone else. Yeah. Good evening to everyone. Thanks for being for inviting me here. I'm Stefano Polato, I'm a chef, a cook, I like to say. I'm in charge of the space food uh, lab for Arbotech. Uh, let's say things as they are. I think it was all probably born almost for, as a game because of the intuition which David Avino had and was then implemented within the Arbotech reality came because Luca Parmitano, just before leaving, wanted, during his training, wanted to verify what food he was going to have once he was on the space station. And having a look at the menus, he almost wanted not to leave anymore, actually, uh, go to the mission. And so from there, Arbotech had the idea of producing specific food, products which could be created specifically, custom-made for the needs of the astronaut as a person, let's say, okay, something nutritional but also pleasing, 
So this idea of a bonus food, something extra compared to what they normally would find in the spacecrafts, which are stuff that are NASA or Russian, as you can imagine. And so we had this idea of having also the psychological side of taste, something, a product which would allow the astronaut to be happier also, let's say, in, his, uh, in, his, uh, in the space station. Why did we suddenly have this need for this kind of product? I want to explain. Because both Russian and the US uh, space agencies had really kind of uh, stopped on this idea of kappa ration, you know, the K ration, survival ratio. Everything that we still find aboard now is still connected with the old concept of survival. So there's no pleasing the taste. A texture or smell of foods. This was a step that neither of these agencies had made yet. Maybe they had forgotten that they st astronauts stay uh, for quite a long time now in space. So it was 10-15 days to begin with but now actually they stay there even uh, six months or up to one year the last two Americans. So we can say that even from a you know, point of view of taste, the need is quite different. So we tried to uh, make the next uh, step for in this topic. The quality step was that we understood that basically, yes, the International Space Station is a laboratory of microgravity. First you heard David say that many experiments are carried out there to understand how fluids would behave, how vegetables would behave, how any element would behave in that particular environment. But actually, from a medical point of view, if we can say this, the actual laboratory is the person itself, is a human being. So trying to understand what happens to an organism when they are, let's say, thrown in a environment which is totally different from daily life. Samantha Cristoforetti, for example, left when she was 36 years old. For 36 years, she lived with her weight and using certain muscles and with the skeleton holding up her weight. So genetically, she has received for 36 years the same information. This body is suddenly thrown into reality in which you use completely different muscles from the ones you use on the earth. You use the ones more for turning than the ones that you use to holding yourself up and moving. With no weight. So, physically, but also psychologically actually, there's a complete overturning of your perception. So, your genes don't receive the same information as they received on the earth and the inputs they give to the different organs of your body say I'm growing old the the message which arrives is that you can die off because you have become old we can see that the effects in fact are accelerated cellular aging so when the gene turns off my cell is going to age quicker uh, muscular atrophy. I'm not using the same muscles I use in the uh, on the ground, so I don't I lose them. And the same happens with bones. You have a huge reduction in density, effects on blood flow, and reduction of red blood cells and redistribution of body fluids, especially in the very first moments when you've just uh, arrived into this environment. There are some images. Um, that Samantha Crossefaretti has taken, in which you see, when you see this in any astronaut, that especially in the first week, their face is quite red and bloated because the fluid of our body need to adapt to this uh, new environment. So in this, specifically in the first moments when you reach the space base, you have to be really careful. The typical example actually is in the first three days, the body 
uh, is subject to something which we could call syndrome to space adaptation. No, it's, I can hear perfectly, I don't know about you. For which the people who arrive have their lymphatic system completely upturned. So, uh, as we were saying, there's some activities that you can't even carry out in the first days. Classic example is the walk in space. We've seen the image of Luca Parmitano with the huge space suit and the helmet. You can imagine if you are completely um, unfazed from a perception point of view, it's true that they give you medicines, but actually when you go outside with a helmet on, if you start feeling nauseal, so it's terrible. So the astronauts in the first three days on the station normally are left really at rest. They mustn't make any risky activity because it's hard. So this was the first step but from Caparmitano. We produced some food, some food that was supposed to represent like Sunday lunch, let's say, the traditional meal. He According to you, an Italian person, a Sicilian person going into space, he's starting and says, I have to be there for six months, uh, like 400 kilometers from the Earth. What would he like to eat? What do you think he asked for? Apart from tiramisu, which is too simple, it's sitting, it's written there. What do you think he asked for? Pasta? Lasagna, you knew that. Uh, yeah, lasagna. Because as Italian, the first thing that he thought was, I need lasagna. And so we tried also in this case to make lasagna. And then I can tell you something else. Of course, he wanted to finish his meal with tiramisu, as you can see here, a pudding, a typical Italian pudding. Anything else you can think of? He's Sicilian. This is a bit harder for you maybe to understand. No, it could have been. Yes, we're working on cannoli, but it's quite hard that because they're fresh. Wine, yes, for example. Is that interesting? Let's say something about wine, also the preparation. Actually, wine, any kind of, let's say, um, alcohol cannot be delivered. It can't be sent onto the International Space Base for many reasons, uh, obvious reasons, even though we have always suspected that the Russians probably uh, secretly have something. Make, I'll make you a question. Uh, it's true it's not guide, it's not driven by anything, but you wouldn't go onto a plane that's driven by somebody who's drinking. But also the image is not very pleasant of people drinking in space. But actually what I wanted to say is that Sicily, there is a particular food, and he asked for this. It's called caponata, it's basically like a ratatouille, we could say. It's a typical mixture of uh, vegetables with lots of garlic. It's typical of uh, Sicily. Uh, for having mercy of people working with him, we didn't put too much garlic in it. So we made a light version of this caponata. But this is to uh, make you understand a very important psychological side of the um, situation. Especially for Luca Parmitano, he really had a psychological strong impact. When people leave for this mission, and they're chosen about a couple of years earlier, or even more actually, Samantha was nominated two and a half or three years earlier. Normally we ask them, when you leave, what would you like to eat? What would you like to eat once you're there? I think the funniest things we should say, because they're quite cute, because of course when we think about, uh, when we ask this question to anyone, the first things that come to mind are um, the, the kind of food of your tradition, of your grandparents, your kids' food, let's say, if you've got to, through taste, live back on the earth for a few seconds, what you're going to search for subconsciously is the tastes and perfumes of your childhood. So a German astronaut, for example, wanted to take with himself a pudding 
made with uh, like um, uh, tapioca flour, which his grandmother made with him, and the kind of things that he normally ate at home, the spezza that are typical from the areas he comes from, sausages and lentils. So each person, this German student can understand here, each person wants the things from their childhood, but the hardest thing is to uh, please someone who says, no, actually, can I taste it? No, but my grandmother did it and made it differently. Okay, this is a disaster. It's very hard to uh, please everyone because, of course, the recipes you carry out on Earth are, compared to the ones you can do on space, have completely different treatment to them and criteria with which they're produced. Let's anticipate this. So the food needs to last from 18 to 24 months conservation at uh, room temperature, let's say, because there are no fridges in that space uh, craft, or else there are fridges, but they're not used for food. They're used for experiments, for other stuff, to conserve uh, samples that they need for research. So this was our starting point. And it was our first victory in a way, because at the beginning it was supposed to be more a kind of uh, boost, uh, giving uh, to someone the satisfaction and the possibility of feeling at home through the taste of what he was eating, even just for a few seconds, eating the typical dish from his original area. So. We also understood that actually food has other functions as well. Uh, during Luca Parmitano's mission, we were really happy with him and enjoyed some scenes in which he exchanged his tiramisu for maybe the Russian caviar. So there was this exchange, this cultural exchange also. So the moment of lunch and of supper, the meals, are the only moment in which all the astronauts, as you can see in the top left photo, meet up together because for the rest of the day they're all busy with their own activities, let's say. So they don't meet up and they don't exchange communication. These are the two moments of the day in which they can really socialize. And food, as always, as it is on the earth, where around tables very often you decide the future of humanity and this still happens. The same happens uh, in microgravity. So there's this cultural exchange of ideas and tastes and... Uh, and of course first we were talking about uh, speeded uh, cellular aging. Um, this includes also stress and the management of stress. So these moments are very important. There's some laser studies that determine that a good mental health and stress management in certain situations really avoids and um, contains this accelerated aging. Of course, food must guarantee also certain performances. So you have to uh, eat for six months. You can't eat lasagna and tiramisu for six months because it will probably affect uh, your, let's say, performance, your body shape. So after that, we decided to take a different track, let's say. But of course, the food has got to guarantee survival as well and give the astronaut the possibility of making the most of his physique during his work. As we can see, the American astronaut here flying around, the one on the right. Of course, we have to also be concerned about their health and wellness when we talk about the food today more than ever. This, in a way, was also the path we went along. So we started with the psychological boost of astronauts' lives so that he was pleased considering this as if it was a Sunday lunch. We always imagine the idea of a Sunday lunch in which the astronaut is able to eat, let's say, his lasagna or his childhood food, and this makes him go back to the ground, to Earth, when he was with his family. Then we started thinking of the other two main aspects Stefano mentioned, the astronaut's performance, so from the Sunday meal 
uh, as Stefano said, we thought, yes, okay, but what about all the other days? The astronaut needs to eat well even when it's not Sunday. So from there we started considering performance and health and wellness for the astronaut. And these are really the three themes that have guided our research and development activity. Before we have a look at the other slide, I'd like to go deeper into one of these themes. At a certain point we realized that we had reached the first goal, so the fact of pleasing the astronaut uh, had been gained, okay, from our data available that they, uh, Luca Parmitano and his colleagues gave us, let's say. So then we decided to change a little bit the track and make the most of what we'd done up till then. But at that point, David and I were not enough anymore because uh, until you create products that okay, are complicated because you have to please our customer, who in this case was Parmitano, was hard. But still, we were also interested in guaranteeing certain nutritional values that would allow the astronaut to contain the damages that we saw earlier, the weakening of his muscles and bones, and the stress management, and also redistribution of body fluids, as we've already seen, because that, for example, you can't use too much salt in that case because it affects the fluids of your body. But at the same time, we wanted to keep uh, nutritional values in the food which we were proposing. But there was a very important obstacle here, which is conservation at room temperature for at least 18 months. So we also had to try and select all the technologies that now are available and make the most of the existing ones to guarantee live food, not dead food, let's say. Then we also selected a method. We researched where to start from and we found out that the best method to start creating functional food is this. This is a study by the Harvard University, which maybe is more common now, maybe more people know it, but uh, five or six years ago it was quite new. And it's what now internationally is embraced by many nutritionists as the ideal system for feeding. It's also a system that has given us a huge help actually because following these principles we can plan the week, week by week but in a way also the following six months in an easier way because we know where we need to work. This is an important step which goes beyond the food pyramid that we all know about, which gave, uh, gave us a base of fruit and vegetables and at the top the fat foods. But it never gave us the indications of how to combine these foods and in which quantity. This instead is a solution which is much more clear and tells us much better what we should be eating. But still we were not completely satisfied, there was still something missing. What we were missing was a nutritionist, a food technologist, a dietitian, and engineers. The Algotech engineers were basic in all this work. So today, everybody talks about holistic approach to anything. And I think this was really the key for our project, for our ready to, la to launch products and Algotech to put together different knowledge, of course, all managed very carefully and cleverly by David, who is our really leader, who decides many things and shows us the right path to go to follow, let's say. But actually, without that team of all these people, of all these skills, we wouldn't have got anywhere, because as a cook, I would have been maybe pleasing the astronaut, but I wasn't prepared on the technological side or nutritionist side. So, okay, here they're saying, you said chef, dietitian, nutritionist, engineer, food technologist. Maybe the next step would be that you need a designer. This is why we're here, probably. Eh? The only missing figure here was a designer. 
So this was our benchmark, let's say, our reference point for creating our food. The whole of this with the uh, mixture of different skills that really was what made us do the leap. Uh, now we're going to have a look at a video and then I'd quite like to have a debate maybe with you, see if there are concepts that you'd like to um, go in more thoroughly, things that we have to, that we've been through, maybe we can clarify better because today when we speak about food or feeding or well-being or quality or tradition, I think we need to pay great attention and be precise about what we're talking about because the habit of modern life is to just speak about things very generally without actually having a precise knowledge of what we're talking about. So we're going to go back to the uh, single dish, let's say. I can't really hear what she's saying well enough to translate it. She's describing a little bit the contents of a plate in which you have a combination of different foods. So you have like different dishes in one. So that you know that you have, you're eating the complete nutrients you should be eating without adding anything else. This was one of her favorites. There she also has snacks, which are kept, uh, let's say, the correct kind of healthy uh, fats that you're allowed, like fruit, dried fruit, and stuff like this. Nuts and almonds. And she brought olive oil with her as well. So some healthy snacks, there is also dried fruit. Or dehydrated rather fruit. Like apples, things that you can find also on earth, you know, dehydrated fruit. This is how she eats her snacks. So there's a fun way of eating healthy food, is what you say. Okay, not so easy to follow this video because it was <clears throat> actually filmed from space. So she was showing all the envelopes uh, that she keeps on this table uh, with the conserved uh, food, preserved food, and you could see the packaging and how they were uh, composed, let's say, what kind of uh, 
envelope they were in, and Samantha at a certain point showed a kind of greyish envelope with uh, dried fruit. Uh, that very sad packaging is what is normally used for the survival kit. So already it doesn't look very appetizing actually because it looks exactly just with a survival kit. So we also tried to play on the image a little, giving also a pleasing for the eye when you have to consume your food. Uh, the eye should be, the vision should be the first thing to be pleased actually. I know maybe I'm repeating myself, but you also eat with your eyes actually. You can't not involve uh, uh, pleasing the vision when you approach food. Otherwise, it's not just psychological, but also metabolically. We start already with some obstacles. Whereas, if you feel happy when you're about to approach your food, actually allows you to digest better what you're going to eat. So these are the requirements that the space food should have and basically are given by the NASA Association because they're the ones who assess the products and say whether they're acceptable or not. So as you've seen, it's got to have low weight and small volume. Of course, nutritional requirements need to be up to standards, a suitable packaging, and also, it should be easy to consume, uh, ease of consumption. These products should be easy to consume. Also, the consistency. This is highly interesting. There's a whole study about the consistency food should have. When the astronaut collects the, with his spoon, the spoonful, this shouldn't fly around in space. Otherwise, it could be quite hard and create also problems towards the instruments or cells could be um, polluting the space uh, base and during the he could suddenly have a piece of food in his mouth or ingest it by mistake so really it's important that it doesn't fly around consistency is defined volatile risk they should avoid that products you're trying to eat fly around in the space station and also long shelf life uh, bec uh, up to 24 months because of course the astronaut doesn't take his picnic with him like when we go on a, a daily um, trip but actually they're um, for the, 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 the space uh, base is taken to the base, the food is taken earlier and it has to last for all the time they're there, plus NASA wants to have an extra life to be certain. So, if you think about this, actually these will all be things that will be quite useful on the Earth as well. So basically to have food which you don't... Um, throw around easily when you eat it, which has a long shelf life without using two refrigerators, which guarantees suitable nutritional requirements, and that is a low weight and small volume, and easy to cook and to eat, why not? because we are always lacking time and this is something that market analysis uh, always confirm okay uh, in Italy maybe this is a bit different but in general if we make market research and analysis on a wide range of countries uh, to cook for many countries is considered simply take something out of the freezer and put it in the microwave or an oven. So we're always in a rush. The easiest thing would be to eat a slice of pizza. Yes, of course, I'd love to eat pizza every day, but we know that it's not healthy. And so we thought, okay, from space to the earth, from space considering food consistency, ease of consumption and preparation, considering that we don't need fridges to conserve 
and that we could take it with us in our backpack and maybe at three o'clock we haven't yet had lunch, we're at the computer on our desk and we can open the package and eat it. Considering many other things, we started with a new line which is exactly basically the same line we use in space with the same requirements, food which is highly controlled and carefully prepared with the very different functions and usable on earth by people who maybe go sailing for example. We had an amazing feedback from sailors because these are people who sail on their boat maybe also for races or for training or for leisure. For them to eat very quickly is very simple, it's important or else uh, on board services, for example, when we are flying on planes, especially on interconnectal, intercontinental crafts, if I have often this feel, when, especially if I'm traveling in economy, they say to me, would you like rice or chicken? Anything you say, I have the feeling that has always the same taste, whether you choose chicken or rice, why? Because it tastes glutamate, it tastes of what it's preserved with, basically. Instead, we don't use conservatives and preservatives in the food. And this is something we made a study with the astronauts in high, uh, when you're flying in the sky, can be compared a little bit to microgravity because there's a different pressurization and even more so in microgravity, our body fluids tend to accumulate. And so many astronauts have told us, as many others say no, but many have said yes, when I'm on the space base on a microgravity situation, I don't feel taste. And we started to think, how is that possible? Others have said no. And this is strange, we have to really study this especially Italians, because we asked the same question to Italians, and they said, no, this is not true at all, I have exactly the same feeling. And so we said to say, but if I asked an American and he says he can't taste anything, as if he was eating with a blocked nose, like other Russians have told me as well, we should launch a study, we launched a study to try and understand scientifically and analytically what happens and so we started to carry out this study with some astronauts and we made these bars that ones that uh, Samantha Christopheretti was showing. We made these bars first of all with different shapes. It's a scientific study we carried out with, I can't remember which university, whether Belgian or French. We made them triangular, square and circles and we started from the classic bar with uh, zero sugar, with more sugar, less sugar and so on, with different concentrations, the same more or less salt, to try and understand the perception of that the different astronauts had. So we asked them to do um, this connection uh, and to eat it on the ground. Of course, they didn't know how much sugar and salt it had. But you tell me, make this evaluation chart and the same then we did when they were orbiting. And these days we are analyzing the results. So we haven't yet got the scientific result. But basically why we've done this is because for many people also who live on the ground, on the earth, actually the perception of taste can change during your life. Let's think especially for people, for example, who are under chemotherapy uh, or other cures in which you have to take very strong um, therapies for your senses, for your body. So, to find a taste which is 100% pleasing means to also guarantee the consumer with certain pathologies to still be pleased through the consumption of food. 
And luckily, I have had a father uh, with chemotherapy, and this was a problem for him because it's something in which you're already feeling ill, and it's already a difficult moment, and then you eat food that doesn't taste of anything because you don't feel taste anymore. It's, it's even worse. It makes things even harder, let's say, also for your recovery. So this is an experiment that we're really fond of because we'd like to reach uh, some scientific data about this so that we can really have a basis, important basis, about what is the perception of taste both on Earth and, of course, in extreme situations, physical or also uh, environmental. Of course, we can't promise that this problem can be solved, but this is just an example to show you that we started from uh, astronauts, from pleasing astronauts. We've reached to the Earth. We've given you the examples of how these food can be used on planes that often have the same problem. I'm trying to solve this. Maybe we can also scientifically, maybe in the future, solve at least in part, partially the problem of people who have the perception of taste changed in a critical moment of their life. We can help sports people. We can bring this into everyday life when we're in a rush and have no time. And also bring really good food, but also easy to prepare, but also pleasing visually in remote, difficult places like, for example, petrol uh, extraction platforms. Of course, compliments first of all. You are keeping us here suspended because we're waiting to hear how you preserve this food. How do you manage to do this? I hope you'll tell us in a moment. I also want to understand, are you already in restoration, traveling restoration? Because I think this is what you would be really the best outcome for your project. In some environments, yes, we are already present. Of course, where the path was a bit more open, let's say, it's easier. We have obstacles like some giants. We are a tiny company. Our production is still uh, very small. Our numbers are not uh, huge, so they don't really allow us to be completely competitive. Of course, our costs are quite high as well. But we'll see that our high costs are also determined by... I'd like also to interact with someone else on the concept of quality. We really start from a high quality of raw materials because with no conservatives and preservatives in our technologies, we really have to select uh, original, very high raw materials, raw uh, ingredients. So, of course, this also affects our costs, our prices. Do you use high pressure? Yes, also, yes, we do. We use a series of different technologies, among which certainly HPP, which is high pressure, where you reach amazing levels, uh, say 6,000 bars of pressure. And uh, through this, uh, combined with other technologies, because it's not just this, it can't sterilize, but it pasteurizes, we can obtain um, products that are really stable. Another question, if I may, is about the tests you carried out. Have you chosen different shapes of the samples? Was it to identify basically the different bar, the different combination? Or you were thinking that maybe the shape could affect the perception? Yeah, yeah, no, this was the reason. And would you publish these results? Yes, we're still working on it. We're collecting them right now, actually. 
normally when you wait a lot, it means that their big results are important. They're keeping us suspended, or they're keeping us suspended because the human samples is just astronauts, yes, yes, no. It would be interesting to uh, do this also on other samples, and this will certainly be carried out in our next experiments when we will have reached uh, a first uh, group of answers from this first experiment will certainly widen the range of the people we submitted to because also we'll have a benchmark of how we can compare the tests. So, has anybody already have a question among the students? Do you have questions already? Not yet, so... We have some future technicians here, actually. What do you think about this? Uh, let's say that the idea is great. The technologies were already given, but it's very interesting the way they're implementing them because certainly it means also lower costs because if you think about airlines, Yes, if airlines maybe start making tickets less expensive, no. But it's true, yes, it could be made less expensive. You must also understand that, um, as Stephen was saying, the selection of the raw materials is very important. Classic example, if is we make a pulses a soup that we did with the Slow Food, we worked with the Slow Food Association. We met uh, them and crossed their path and in some ways we matched very well with their philosophy, but specifically because we chose these pulses and in the laboratory we verified that the micronutrients basically should work. First of all, they had to be extremely digestible pulses because, uh, let's say, that uh, you don't want uh, strange effects within the space base, then they have to have a very high protein level because we selected it as a substitute for meat. Uh, so that they would give a certain level of proteic uh, nutrition. So we needed specific pulses. But not too much iron also, because it's not good for astronauts, iron, too much iron. So all the micronutrients should be antioxidants. So, of course, that's why we met with Slow Food, because they have an amazing data bank for this for these kind of studies and so they helped us find a solution which was very also fast actually and but also apart from this we don't use any salt in the preparation of our products. NASA gave us the, um, compl uh, the obligation of being under 0 0.05, so they said, okay, we don't use any salt, it's easier. We need to use a natural taste of the product, so the uh, lentils, the pulses should be already tasty in uh, cultivated in environments that would give them a good taste. So I started from this to say that our target from the point of view of marketing is a high level target because of the selection that we make right from the beginning. If we buy a kilo of normal chickpeas, they cost probably three or four euros, not more, it's probably already a lot. A kilo of the chickpeas we use cost about 18 euros a kilo to us. We do this because from the analysis we understood that they really had all the features that would have made our product super class products. So if we're selling the product, this is really low marketing, but if we have to sell it for two euros, really we wouldn't be able to even produce it. So it's not possible to have this kind of selection of raw materials and a low cost. But at the same time, we realize that you can't sell a sachet like this 
even if it's a ready-made plate, it can't cost 15 to 20 euros. So we try to have a price range which is approachable. Do you want to know the cost now, I presume? A ready-made a single um, 250 grams of a complete um, dish costs about 7 euros. Uh, the one maybe with shrimps costs a little more because, of course, uh, shrimps are a more expensive ingredient. Even fish uh, costs seven euros because we selected a certain kind of fish. But the, these are all products, most of them are actually organic as well because we selected really super organic uh, producers. Uh, you know, probably if you're in the business, how this works. In the end, we'll give you one of their samples to taste. I tasted one today and I was amazed, actually, really. One of these envelopes, these sashes, actually made me full. And I really believe that first you said, almost jokingly, in all this stuff, we are lacking a designer. But I think actually with designers you could make a huge operation and an extra leap, really an interesting leap. In any case, I think that the sashes are already nice and they look very well uh, um, designed. Obviously you found uh, uh, professional photographers who do this. Maybe the packaging we could do something about, what do you think? Probably then we need to open it and eat it and you understand more. But certainly I imagine that this is a packaging which allows the product to be preserved uh, with no influence from heat uh, sources and it's also easy to stock probably. But I think we could do a workshop about this. It's not possible this year, but next year could be an interesting workshop together uh, to cross all your knowledge and skills with designer skills. I can see already Federico lighting up this idea. I want to ask a couple of things. In the video first, Samantha Cristoforetti showed a sachet saying they were dehydrated uh, strawberries. In your case, for example, it seems that these are ready-made because I think to rehydrate in those conditions is not easy. But the problem is also if there is something that needs a rehydrating also at home, if you make the wrong dose, you put too much or too little water, it changes the consistency, the texture and the taste and so probably it's not so agreeable. And the other thing I wanted to ask instead regarding the packaging is I saw that you use a quite a hard heavy um, envelope because this is for space uh, ships I imagine and the cost is sustainable in that case. The, but what I want to know is if instead I have to buy this sachet and take it home and eat it, maybe I would like to have a packaging which is a bit lighter and also um, I don't need it to last 24 months, probably the shell life could be less as well. Um, actually, this is something I wanted to talk about, food in general. Uh, so sustainability of the food change. The problem is not so much uh, of cost. Today our packaging, the impact of the packaging on the final price, now we're going to talk about marketing as well, but I really don't know much about marketing, so really it's going to be intuitive what I say. The uh, impact on the final cost from, of the packaging is really hardly any. Instead, yes, for the sustainability, of course, there will be much more to say. It's true that it's part of our studies that any of the dish that we create isn't necessarily put in the same packaging because we've used different multi-layers with different layers depending on the contents of the sachet, basically, and the shelf life we need. But, of course, 
uh, strawberries were not ours, no. We do those, yes, as well, dehydrated, but that's how they, they eat them without rehydrating them. They have a system there to do them, but the fruit normally they eat as it is, like a snack. Yes, the work on the texture is amazing because, of course, the volatility, the flyaway food has a terrible impact in the space uh, base. And especially the topic of texture has two points of view. One, of course, of the flyaway problem of pieces that fly away. Maybe you have a panel with a switch and a piece of food can also affect the functionality of the tools. The other thing about the texture is the consistency when you eat it actually within your mouth. It should be crunchy because if it's not crunchy, it doesn't taste good just like on earth. But actually it's one of the easiest things to do from the point of view of consistency because it's already condensed, let's say, and it doesn't fly away. There are also studies actually, uh, NASA papers, in which they have determined that um, the fact of having within a product like this uh, or within a meal some crunchy parts is uh, pleasing from a psychological point of view and also from the feeling point of view much more than if the food is liquid. And uh, specifically if you have 15% in your daily feeding of crunchy food like a dried fruit or nuts or food that you need to chew more. For a person it means that you can reduce your daily intake of food of 10%. So you eat less and you'll feel, you feel full and satiated in the same way. So there's a real study about consistency and what kind of consistency food should have to be pleasing from the point of view of taste and of feeling. Another question? Maybe I haven't seen or understood quite clearly how you eat these. What happens when you open the sachet, let's say? In space, I mean. We have a video of Samantha actually that uh, she shows us what the sachets have inside them from space. Shall we have a look at the video? Yeah, we can look at the video. This is just an example. Okay, I want to comment it because, first of all, these are single ingredients but not the product already mixed like we've done with Sasha. This is an experiment we did with her in which we gave single ingredients. So she had, I don't know, what did we give her? I don't remember. Quinoa, um, shrimps, uh, pea cream, pea soup, which kind of, and then she put it on this piadina, and it's like a pita bread, let's say. So it was an experiment in which we told her in what sequence to put the things, so the pea uh, paste at the bottom because it would keep it all together, then the quinoa because it doesn't fly away, then the fish. So this was an experiment, but normally in the space station, and this was really the big effort by Stefano, is to create a consistency that is very similar to what you eat on the earth, but which wouldn't fly away. So rice would become more like a risotto, so that the single rice uh, corn doesn't fly around, of course. It seems obvious, but of course it, we had to also make it a little bit crunchy. What they do is basically they put the spoon inside the sachet and eat directly from the sachet. From certain products, of course, you've got to pay some attention, like for example, this quinoa salad with fish and vegetables, which yes, is fairly compact, but now it's hard for me to show you holding the microphone. 
the best solution is to make a little pressure on the other hand with your spoon so that you keep the product a bit compact before you put it up with the spoon. So it's just a little bit of attention you need to pay that instructions. It was a Friday the day of the experiment and the next day she was riding the Hoover to clean it all up. So uh, there were some small parts that yes flew away actually. So we need to carry out the experiment again actually. You talked about psychological side of taste and how to improve the life of people in space. Do you have data about this? So how much has this affected their actual everyday life? How do you have feedback from this? It would be interesting to see how much food, so what we eat, is really affecting our mood and our psyche and understanding which food could improve also the life of a person depending on single tastes because I read that actually in the intestines we have also uh, brains um, connect cells connected to the brain which really give us a subconscious almost primitive pleasure with food. So I'd like to know if you have some actual data of the improvement of their daily life. I want to answer this question um, telling you that um, four and a half years ago we proposed this uh, to the Italian European Space Association and then they told NASA and we were looked, uh, they thought we were crazy, they really. Of course there are data but they're not much data, very few, because as the whole environment of food and feeding in microgravity was left, uh, was discarded a bit, left to the side, even experiments were not carried out. Now NASA seems to have opened up a bit on this and probably these studies uh, that you were talking and asking about will be implemented much more within the other studies that they make on the space station. There are many studies on Earth, actually, what you were talking about, we know this already for a daily life on Earth. And what we tried to explain to NASA, basically, because that's the agency we talked to, that to have someone in microgravity who already has an accelerated cell um, aging is really a laboratory for human beings but also allows us to reduce the times of research because if an astronaut in six months has the same aging you have in 10 years in the world it's you could study on six people what you would take 60 years on earth to study so through this pressure I think they're starting to understand we're getting towards a new era which will also be studying these aspects of their life. For the moment, there are really quite few. We uh, started researching more acts about micronutrients, and we found that there really there isn't a previous research. So what we based our research on and our efforts is more what we know about on day life on Earth. I think it's also important to say that we should look at the future NASA, but also European Space Agency is thinking about missions that will be further and further, trips to Mars. For example, if we were traveling to Mars today, it would take two years. There are amazing studies about this that are still carried out every day. For example, they did the mission Mars 500 in which they took four or six, I don't remember, um, I say unlucky astronauts and they take, kept them for 500 days closed in Russia within a spacecraft let's say for 500 days studying all the group dynamics how they behaved within this group they were very highly selected people they were not astronauts but with an astronaut profile and they discovered many things here but they didn't discover anything actually, if you think about it, 
because if they had had a problem in 500 days, actually they knew that they could walk out of this fake experiment. Whereas in space, it will be two years of being not 400 kilometers, but 100,000 kilometers from Earth. You know that Mars is kind of like elastic uh, towards uh, Earth, so it's uh, like 50 million kilometers and then it goes further and further. So we'll launch when you can get there in six months, but then if something happens, that's a problem, they can't just open the door and say, okay, give up the experiment. So all these tests and fake experiments you do um, will be actually so important. The psychological boost will be so important in this kind of situation. There's a Danish psychologist who has studied together with the NASA a series of games, combination games, let's say, because the astronauts will be left there in a way in which if they are behave well, they can digit a combination and have something sweet, cute, like the photo of your child uh, for a psychological boost because you've been good. So digiting the combination as a prize uh, after you've been feeling maybe a little bit down from a psychological point of view. So even to eat a lasagna could probably be important in this case. Unfortunately, we have no certain data. Yeah, this is highly stimulating, I must say. It's very really interesting what you're saying. You went also to the MIT, I think, recently. You'll tell us about this. I'd like to understand if you had to open a restaurant, and how would you do this based on your experience? Or if you had to create a product, how would you, how this experience would affect your products, how it has affected your restaurant, because you have a restaurant. And I'd like to also know from you what you think about the developing, the development of Italian and not just Italian cooking. So, regarding um, the approach that at the moment I have in cooking, thanks to this experience, certainly it's changed a lot. I brought a lot of technology into my cooking, but specifically I also started an approach which is what we had for Samantha's food, a more anthropological approach to food. So I started to search for everything which was the history of ingredients the ingredients we used in these productions, and we discovered some very interesting things. For example, that quinoa is not it's just a fashion, just a fad, but actually it's a vegetable which has uh, been surviving in a very hostile uh, environment and has modified through time. And these modifications have actually turned into amazing nutritional qualities, much higher than other cereals or vegetables. The same we could say for the pulses we were talking about first. These are all pulses that come from the um, farmer's tradition, of which we have been abandoned because in terms of quantity they weren't so profitable in production, but taking these back, we also understood how some products, even though they belong to the same family, have much higher qualities and properties than others. Another thing that I was saying is that I really acquired a series of technologies that I could apply to food. First, somebody made an interesting question, and he said, okay, we all know the technologies. Yes, okay. This is also what I said to MIT. Still, 99% of production, especially of preserved food, is back at 1861, and we pasteurize every three days. We just pasteurize and sterilize. Basically, these are the concepts that are applied in everyday production. The fact is that Every two weeks, we update the software of our computer, we update our software on our mobile phone. In all other fields, technology is super fast, but technology and food, actually, from my point of view, at least from what I've seen 
up till now going around in production plants, we've seen that they're not really interested in updating their technologies, probably because the market request, uh, market demand is quite uh, ignorant, let's say, from this point of view because as purchasers we have the possibility of changing production processes if we're quite happy with what we receive now producers are still going to go on because to change production processes of course for big production plants is a big investment so it takes a long time to have a return on these investments and probably this is one of the reasons for which many production technologies are quite not uh, advancing, let's say. So you create a technology, but of course you have to have a certain return on this technology to make it profitable. We can also say that in these latest years, uh, food knowledge and um, is being more uh, is improving people are more careful the basic customer is uh, more interested in this hpp that we're talking about is very popular now because consumers have understood it's a friendly technology it can preserve very well products without treating let's say so it's preferred in some cases to classic pasteurization so I think from a certain point of view, also producers and production plants will have to change a little bit, specifically because in this way they could raise also the quality concept which we so much talk about but often we don't know about. It's not just selecting the original chickpea or runner bean because it has a higher nutritional value but also these nutrients need to be preserved until when you eat them actually so quality can be translated also in quality of the food treatment and the packaging that needs to be improved and in you should really it should be really reflected in many aspects of food production i think we could go on infinitely with this how long do we still have? So, first I want to ask a question to close this. I want to ask you a question. We've seen this food that we take to space. Then we've said, seed Italian, we've seen Italian people who ask for their traditional food, somebody asking for lasagna, Samantha Cristoforetti who wanted very unusual dishes actually, and so on. The German person who wanted spetzel and the uh, sausages from his childhood. But what is common to everyone? What do we need at the end of a meal, especially Italians? Coffee. Okay, so we are missing coffee right now, but pay attention, of course, here there are many foreign people, maybe uh, she has a very a long coffee, somebody has it short, somebody has it with milk, or Americans tend to have a very, very long watery coffee, so at that point we say, Arbotec what is our real beating heart in the company it's the engineering then if you remember we said we make food we train the astronauts and so on coffee how the coffee we mean as italians is espresso coffee you know short normally and then if somebody wants a little more water everybody you can just press twice and have more water in it at a certain point the beating heart of our company said but why can't we do something nice again not just from a point of view of uh, the boost the psychological boost of the astronaut we said but also from the point of view of the technology and here it is see here at top right this is called ISS it means International Space Station, which is Espresso. And at this point, we search for someone 
We turn around at 800 meters from our company, there is Lavazza premises, you probably heard this name. And so one of the biggest uh, coffee companies in the world. And so we went to them, knocked on their door with our little case, which was not full of money. We don't have much money. We entered there and we said, hi, who are you? Well, actually, we are from Argotech and who are you? Okay, we have an idea and things started to change when we said this. We said we want to bring, and we promise we will bring Italian espresso in space in 18 months. In fact, in 18 months' time, there was going to be our friend Simanta Cristoforetti that we got to know very well. And so we started talking to them about this project, and as a big company they are, they decided to believe in a tiny company which is ours, and they said, Okay, yes, we're going to count on you, we're going to bet on you, and we promise that in 18 months we would take their product to the International Space Station, and we started working. We went to the NASA, I love to tell this story, we went there and said, hi, we'd like to bring Italian espresso coffee to the ISS. The Americans said, that's cool. <laughs> Great, fantastic, we're going to do this. Then I started saying, to make an espresso coffee, we need to do something, we need to be uh, build a machine, okay, cool. Yeah, but this machine needs to have eight bars of pressure, so eight times the atmospheric pressure. And they started looking at me and said, oh, okay. And then the coffee that comes out of it, within this uh, space cup, which is not exactly a cup, but a little sachet that you see up there, to be a good espresso, the temperature should be 75 degrees. Wow, they said. But the astronaut is going to burn himself if he touches that. And so they started saying, okay, that's a cute idea, bye-bye. And then we went back, we persuaded them that technically it was possible, we made two copyrights on this, two patents on this machine, which was built entirely from the idea to the test to the launch, all in our laboratories, thanks to our engineers, and of course uh, with the partnership with Ravazza. After 18 months, we knocked on the space base, and this was what happened. I still haven't finished actually answered one of his questions because he asked many all in one. Uh, the one of the things he asked was how I see the future development, let's say specifically of Italian cooking, because I think it's more representative without being too nationalist. So from my point of view, I think for example here, like an environment in which we are in a university and uh, academic environment, and there's a chef that's coming here to explain something, 
it should happen the other way around as well. The academic world maybe should enter more into the cooking. So a food technician or nutritionist or designer should cooperate with the chef to find new ideas, new solutions, which can put into the right context, our, in the contemporary context, our tradition. Because just speaking about tradition without actually having the knowledge of what today we need in our everyday life is pointless. I always say that um, salami was created for a need, like the food for astronauts were born, was born from a need, and then it became a traditional food. But today we don't have the need of having a production of salami anymore. Uh, as we have it now. Actually, salami now should be consumed very rarely. This is a banal example, but quite interesting, I think. And it should cost much more, and we should buy less of it and consume less of it. This result can be reached only if we take tradition and update it to modern times. Uh, in Expo, I met Giovanni Levi recently, we had a conference together and chatting. He said to me, in a way we're doing the same thing, Giovanni Levi is a pianist and composer. He said at one point I just was fed up with playing classical music and I decided to updated to the present day, following a need that I felt and that we think we have for contemporary music. The same is what we're doing with food with Argotec. We took the tradition, because here we're talking about pulsa soup basically is a tradition of Italian cooking, but we updated it to the contemporary needs, the needs we have in everyday life. So we're talking about traditional contemporary cooking, like we have classical contemporary music. I think this can be the vision for uh, uh, cooking, contemporary cooking, is to see the cooperation of different skills, like we managed to do with Arcotec, combining very different skills. I think this is uh, what we could do to reach very new solutions in cooking. We need uh, profiles that are not just a cook, but we should integrate different skills. And I think there are probably many questions. Don't worry, we're here. So if anyone wants to start going, you can say, come along, and we're going to stay here, but maybe some people need to go. So you can come and ask questions here. The last message I want to give you about uh, us uh, knocking on Lavazza door and they're doing this and other things that are less uh, maybe famous but that we reached uh, the results. We always work with young people and the message we always want to give especially to you is believe in your dreams. We believe in them every day. They're not uh, it's not important, it is important. I'm nobody and I wasn't anybody even when I knocked on Lavazza's door, but I sent hundreds of mails to Lavazza. Nobody answered until one day, I had already decided I was investing on this project. I was in the meeting room and I said, how can we go on with this project? We have no more money. And I received a phone call. I knew nobody, but I gone on and on and on believing in my dream and pursuing it. Just like with the food part, we went on investing the little money we had. But what we had was an idea. We were persuaded of this idea, which maybe has worked or could work better in the future, but we never gave up. Even though with all the stops that we receive every day, I want to close here because he mentioned Rainsy area. We are the classic example. The Prime Minister came to us, but I can tell you, he, I have no connection with politics, no politician had ever come to us. And it's lovely to be able to say we believed in it, we go on believing, we received blows, we still will receive them in the future, but maybe this is the right direction, so we won't stop believing. Really never abandon your dreams. If we stop dreaming, we give up.